Kyosu Giga is an anime that has been in my top 10 ever since completing it back when it first aired in the fall 2013 anime season. That was the year I got heavy into seasonal anime and this was the series that showed me that anime could be something extraordinary. Every time I rewatch this series, I get worried that this will be the time that it doesn't move me like it did the first time. But even after 5 viewings as of the recording of this review, the series hasn't withered, and it keeps standing above most series out there, at least for myself. Stories about family aren't usually my cup of tea, for whatever reason I just don't seem to get hooked on them more times than not. But when series such as Kyosu Giga add in an extra layer to the family dynamic, such as a mystical layer, generally I'm willing to see where the story will go. And Kyosu Giga is very much a mystical series wrapped full of strange elements that you don't quite know why they are there for a good chunk of the anime. But the series all boils down to a family, of all shapes and sizes and the issues that they face. The same way all families struggle, fall apart and grow together. But because of the direction the staff took, they present it as being far more complex than just that. When in actuality, this family isn't much different than most out there. And that's the beauty of Kyoso Giga's story. The priest and Nari has the ability to draw pictures that get to take life of their own. The outside world obviously fears him and generally stays away from his shrine. One of his drawings, a rabbit named Koto, who was made to be the god of his created city, took life and eventually fell in love with the man who created her. But being a rabbit, there's no way for this love to be fulfilled until another goddess grants the rabbit her body for a time. Under the condition that once Inari responds to her love, she must return her body and go back to being a rabbit. From there, we watch the two slowly but surely build a love and also a family. From an adoptive son to demon-drawn children, for obvious reasons the outside world can't accept this family of demons and the idea of toying with reality as Anari has been doing, so they are forced to flee to the Looking Glass City, a drawn world where life is always perfect. Things that break get rebuilt automatically, people who die don't really die, it's the perfect life for a time being. When life never challenges you and everything goes smoothly, how long until you lose your sanity? Makoto must eventually leave as per the deal made with the god who granted her the body she currently wears. Due to her not returning the body like promise, she starts having visions of the future that show the destruction of the world they live in, and she is forced to flee. Scared her presence will bring the demise to the city her children are currently safe in. So both of the parents leave the children to rule over their perfect kingdom in their stead, and they hope that one day that they might return. Before their departure, their father gave the youngest son his name and power, promising that one day he would bring with him the end in the beginning. But the one who eventually enters the city isn't their parents, but a girl also named Koto, who breaks through to their world looking for a certain rabbit, and things get a bit more complicated. Now what I absolutely adore about this crazy series is even though we have demonic children, a world where everything is bright and fun and nothing is ever wrong, if you strip away these layers and look at all the characters at their core, they are pretty normal and real people, maybe even similar to to your own family, and even if you can't personally relate, you feel for each and every one of them thanks to their character arcs. See, the series might be colorful and fun, but there is a lot of pain in the siblings' eyes and their past. The way the series quickly yet effectively explores all of their backstories and why the Looking Glass City isn't paradise but really hell for them is something that is explored exceptionally well. No family is without their issues, and this one is definitely no exception. One of the highlight episodes for the series is the fourth episode, which explores the eldest sister's obsession with the past. She she lost her mother at a fairly young age, but has all these treasured memories of her, most of which that are associated with objects. The tree that her mother measured their height with, a torn up stuffed animal given to her, and an old beat up teacup she used to drink tea out of with her mother. They all were a part of these memories and she never throws them away. But in this world there's a set time where you can throw your trash in the air and the world will take care of it. But one of her teacups gets thrown away and she goes on a rampage because of this mistake. These memories to her are precious and these junky objects to others? are all she has left of her mother. Now what makes this such a phenomenal episode is how it explores the idea of the past and what we associate with memories. Be it a broken teacup or something else, our minds eventually will fade, and so too can those memories, but we hold on to these objects in hopes that we never truly lose the memories that we hold dear. But sometimes we get so wrapped up in the past we forget about the present, and the episode ends in a way that lets Yase start living in the now rather than the past. She can hold on to her memories without being held prisoner by them. And this is one of the many strong episodes that deal with all the characters' struggles about their challenging family and the pain that they are currently dealing with since the loss of their parents and the hell that they are currently trapped in. The series will constantly throw more twists and turns, backstory and info dumps at you, but somehow manages to tell a story that should need more than 10 episodes, 11 if you count episode 0, and manage to tell the most fulfilling and creative family story I have seen in the anime medium. All the questions you could want answered get 
get answered. Granted, you might need a second viewing if you didn't catch all the information during your initial viewing, who this mysterious girl is, where the parents went and who they truly are, and what the outcome of the Looking Glass City will be. If you remove the layer that makes this series seem magical, it's interesting, but because they layer the siblings in this magical element, a demon sister, the mystical monk-like brothers, the overly powerful girl with a giant hammer and two familiars that she considers family, it helps to present the series in a more interesting light, but never does it rely on those elements to make the family interesting. But rather, these elements just amplify the things we already see with a normal family, like Yase turning into a giant monster when upset. I'm sure many have a sister that you think turned into a giant monster when she gets pissed off. Just in this series, they actually make the sister into a giant monster. The end content focuses on Inari and his lack of love for himself, wanting to fade away due to his inability to love himself despite being able to love his family. A plan set in motion long ago technically goes according to plan, the one thing he didn't expect was the family that he created ended up being more than just a tool to fade away, but rather a real and genuine family that can pull you away from the darkness and help you see the light when you can't. No one is perfect, we all have self-doubt, but that's what family is there for in the end, to help you through those challenging times. A common theme throughout the series. The beauty of Kyosugiga is how it explores this family in such complex yet simple ways at times. The character development is absolutely phenomenal, with all the main cast getting their time to shine and be explored, while also telling a pretty engaging story about what it takes to make family work and that no family is without its issues. For being primarily focused on the core cast, the anime does a great job at building the world they live in, while also exploring the outside world and the idea of gods and other mystical elements surrounding them. Coming out of Kyosugiga every single time, I'm left with a feeling of complete and utter satisfaction. I generally find something new or interesting about the series, and never do I feel like I needed more of any one element. It never overstays its welcome, and it made sure every scene was used to establish something within its cast or world. You might not see where it's going for the first few episodes, but stick with it, because once it wraps up, you'll have witnessed one of the best family-driven anime out there. One of my favorite aspects to the visual direction of Kyoso Giga is how everything around the characters are presented. The idea of the world the characters are in is this make-believe, fictional, yet perfect world, but the story tells us that this isn't the end-all, be-all paradise vacation as it currently stands. Something is missing, and most of the objects in the world are presented in an almost glued-on way, which helps make it feel even more fake as if this world shouldn't exist. It feels like everything around the characters are there in layers instead of looking natural with the cast, thanks to the strokes that detail most objects, which generally are thick white highlights. Most anime will try to blend the background and foreground objects with the characters to make it feel natural and give the illusion of reality for the series, whereas Kyosa Giga went the opposite route more times than not, and very much made it feel like things were tacked on and out of place, as if the characters didn't belong in the world they were in, and everything around them was fake, which helped amplify the story that it was telling. When it went out of the Looking Glass City, they went the opposite route and blended everything more seamlessly. Exceptional touch in my books. The visual direction is a large part why the story was as effective as it was. Without the careful level of detail to the city, it wouldn't have landed what they were aiming for with the script. A story about a dysfunctional family and parents that left them in a city that everything is always perfect and how each of the siblings have their own struggles needs that extra level of detail to the world around them, which it absolutely has. The expressive and sometimes abstract animation style it uses lends itself to give each character a very distinct personality, from Yase's monster form, to Koto's energetic yet destructive personality, to Mioe's calm yet sort of pissed off persona. The way each character was represented was never animated in the same way. Characters who are calm were animated quite differently than characters who had the opposite nature. And it's not just like they detailed moments of high energy with this level of detail, every frame made sure that each character was represented in the best way to match their personality. With the overall design of the Looking Glass City being so memorable, I never forget what it looks like, even months after completing a rewatch. When a fictional place can have such an impact on me that I remember so many nooks and crannies due to the amount of detail and expression put into this world, you know the studio did something right, with the character designs themselves being quite unique from traditional character designs in modern anime. Of course, monsters and supernatural elements look interesting and abstract, but most of the main characters had unique body structures and facial designs to help make them memorable and not something that you'll think, oh, this looks like this other character from X series. Instead, I feel like the characters looked unique not only for their world, but just anime in general. From time to time, I see people take screen caps of a frame where characters aren't polished and it looks messy, but in motion that quote-unquote horrible art, as some like to call it, becomes the most expressive piece of animation out there. Really, this series is a piece of art through and through.
Kosa's voice actress is easily my favorite part when it comes to the voice acting. Her personality can be summed down to as a high energy yet caring but also destructive girl. And if you look at her character in motion with the anime muted, my impression of what her voice would sound like is very different than what they went with. I would assume most studios would make her a bit more gimmicky in the sense her voice fits the norm. But instead she has this very layered voice, one where she's never over hyper or underperformed in any scene. When she is tearing up the street and causing mayhem, she never feels like she's going overboard but rather a kid having fun. It just feels natural. It doesn't feel like an actress portraying a role, but rather a real person, and the character Koto isn't just there to sell merchandise, but really just be a person. Most of the voice acting is memorable, though Yase would be a close second for me with Inari coming in just behind her. It just felt like all the actors had a lot of fun. From the intro song to most of the backing tracks played throughout the series, this had one of the more unique soundtracks in modern anime. Something about the direction the music took really just lands that feeling of the Looking Glass City. It doesn't necessarily feel crafty, to be a good soundtrack, but rather one crafted to match this world, which it does a pretty solid job at. The OP is one of the most memorable ones out there for me with how it was directed visually and the song just being damn catchy. I also just appreciate it when an anime is careful about detailing the sound effects to help land the illusion of reality such as when the city is being destroyed by Kota's giant hammer or Yase is causing a fuss. It's the little details that I appreciate when it comes to sound design. Kyosa Giga is a series that has held a special place in my heart ever since it aired in 2013. It's a series you don't see often, one that doesn't follow trends and try something different. One that feels like artists crafting art, rather than a product to be distributed to consumers. It's why I don't have a major complaint with it, it's a series that knows what it wants to tell, one that gives time to explore the world it made and give all the central characters time to shine. One where you might be a little confused upon your first viewing, but you'll rewatch the series again in one sitting and notice how detailed and well thought out it was. Or maybe you won't get why I adore it so much even after this video. But nonetheless, I love Kyoso Giga and the unique take it took on the family story that it told, and it's why I award the series my ultimate seal of approval, a ranking only for the best of the best anime out there. Few series can remain in my top 10 after all these years, and fewer can be just as good as the first time you watched it, even after so many rewatches. Now, if you want to watch something similar in terms of its story, check out any work from Hasoda, but my personal recommendation would be the movie Boy and the Beast. It's my personal favorite movie of his, focusing on a father and son's story in a very unique and engaging way. If you like the world of Kyoso Giga, you'll more than likely love this film. But that's all for this video. Please let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below. And if you enjoyed the video, remember to leave a like. And if you're new, also be sure to subscribe. And if you want to go the extra mile and help support what I do, then also consider checking out my Patreon. So till next time, everyone, please take care and you all have a good one.